You have your Bibles open to Exodus chapter number 35. Exodus chapter number 35 this morning. We are in Stewardship Month here at First Baptist Church, a time when we focus on our offerings and gifts to the Lord. This morning as I preach, um, it is, I must be honest, this kind of topic is not a necessarily comfortable topic for me to preach on, and that's with in regards to money. You say, well, Pastor, you're a Baptist preacher. Aren't they all comfortable with money? Well, maybe or maybe not. But as we come to Stewardship Month at First Baptist Church, the question is, well, why do we have a Stewardship Month at First Baptist Church? Why do we talk about money? Some people would prefer that the pastor never, ever, ever mention money. I would be happy to accept that money's in the Bible. And they say, well, fine, talk about it, but don't talk about it in regards to the church and offerings. Once again, I'd be happy to accept that. It's here in God's Word. So if in God's Word, then I as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, um, ought to deal with it and talk about it. Well, then the question is, well, it must be, pastor, that the church is really hard up for money. That's why you're preaching on money for the whole month. Well, number one, I'm not preaching on money for the whole month. Okay, it'll be the whole year. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but that also, at First Baptist Church, is not the case. We're working this past week on, on budgets for, for uh, this coming year, and Lord willing, in about three weeks, we'll present a budget to the church to vote on. And um, you know what? Right now, we're at a place where the people of First Baptist Church are incredibly generous. All right, we don't have to worry if we're going to pay the consumer's bill this week. We can pay the consumer's bill this week or this month, whenever it is. Our missionaries don't have to, thankfully, be worried if, if the, they're going to get their support that we've promised to them because this past Tuesday I, or Wednesday I signed all missionary support checks for the month. All right, and that's a good place to be. And we've been at First Baptist sometimes flush with money and sometimes very tight, and right now the Lord's blessed because of your generosity. So then you're like, hey, Pastor Howell, then why do you talk about money? Why have a stewardship month? Because being a good steward is part of being a good Christian. The Bible says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The idea of faithfulness there is not that I'm surviving, but that I'm handling what God has given to me in the best way possible. I like what Brother Erickson said in his video. It's not that just 10% is God's. It's that everything is the Lord's. And how I handle it shows and helps me grow as a Christian. Uh, stewardship and how I give helps God's people grow in their walk and in their faith. And so as we came to Stewardship Month, lo and behold, I'm in my Bible reading this past week, and I come across Exodus chapter number 35. The Lord touched my heart this, that morning. I began to work on this sermon to preach this morning that I thought the Lord would have us look at this morning. And it's about a time... One of the first times recorded that the children of Israel brought an offering to God. Up to this point, they've done some things for the Lord. They've been rescued from their slavery. They've had tremendous blessings, including the rescuing of the, uh, uh, in front of the Red Sea and just miraculous events that have been unfolding from the ten plagues to now their journey. In Exodus chapter 35, God asks and the people give a very generous offering. There are times that at First Baptist Church we would, we would go on an on a, on a asking basis. We typically don't, but we go like for a pie auction when we give money to our teachers, right? And we kind of ask people to give that day. When we had an auction for our school, for the Friends of Bridgeport Baptist Academy, and brought an auctioneer in, he kind of asked people to give. But typically come offering time, I'm not standing up here saying, all right, now I want everyone to give, all right, empty your pockets, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's not how I take an offering here, right? Yeah, we, we don't send ushers down saying, all right, show us your wallet. We'll see if we can pass the plate any further. We don't do that. Th there are even some churches uh, or some religions that ask to see your W-2 forms to make sure you're giving appropriately to their ministry. We've never done that. Well, it's not a, no, I'm just kidding. But here we have an offering that I believe has some lessons for us. You, you see first in verse number 4 of Exodus chapter 35, Moses' request for the offering. It is a strange request. It is not one that we would ever write down and say, this is the way to get a good offering. Except that he says this in verse 4, And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering to the Lord, gold and silver and brass. 
He goes on to say exactly what is needed. There's lights, there's spices, there is dye, there's skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. And then he says, and then every wise hearted among you, in verse number 10, you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. He goes all the way through verse number 19 of this strange offering request, telling him what needs to be done and what the needs are. And in verse number 20, we begin our text for this morning, and the, all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. The first thing that happened is they all left. They left. Moses said, the Lord has commanded you to bring an offering, and they left. This does not portend well. All right, This is not a great beginning, one would think. They all go back to their tents. I wonder if at this point, Moses is saying, I wonder how this is going to turn out. He's had some experience with the children of Israel already. They have not always been, can we say, grateful for God's request or provisions. They've complained when they didn't get exactly what they wanted. They, even at the Red Sea, before the, before the Lord part of the Red Sea, they, they threatened Moses and they said, why did you bring us out here to die? Their faith was pretty weak. So he presents this command of the Lord, this idea for an offering, and they all leave. Verse 21, and they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him up. Remember that phrase about their heart. And everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered it offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and goats' hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering, and every man with whom as was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. And the children of Israel brought a willing offering to the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise a curious works to work in gold and silver and brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in the carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahizamech of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver, and of the cunning workmen, and of the embroiderer, and blue, and in purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for this time. Thank you for this passage. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be touched. Lord, that our hearts will be challenged by what we give to you. Lord, may it be a reflection of our love for you, our desire to invest for you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. When I was reading in Exodus chapter 35 this past week, I was struck by how many times in these 15 verses the word heart, stirred heart, and willing heart was used. The emphasis on this passage, as I read and studied, was not exactly what they brought, but the motivation for what they brought. It wasn't so much what they did, but the motivation for what they did, and even the point where God said, in him, Bezalel, I've put some wisdom in his heart. You see, giving begins in my heart, and giving begins in your heart. Imagine that you're at this event. This was for the tabernacle. This was the first time that we have recorded that God would, quote, dwell in a place. God is everywhere, right? He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But now God was getting together a specific place that his 
presence would be demonstrated in a place that the Bible tells us is called the tabernacle. The children of Israel had been in Egypt for over 400 years, around 430 years in slavery. They'd been down the wilderness for a little while. And for whatever reason, God says, now I'm going to have a, a structure. I'm going to have a structure that's going to represent my presence. I call the tabernacle. He then goes on to instruct Moses to gather an offering for this structure. Can you imagine the excitement, the opportunity that would have been to have a part in the first physical dwelling place of God? To say, you know what? I can help with the tabernacle. You, you see those, those rings, son? Your mom and I gave that for God. You see those, those curtains over there? You see that covering on the outside over there? You see, daughter? We gave that for God. Can you imagine that this operation would have been an exciting time, an amazing thing, an experience, unlike a, a humbling endeavor, to, to think that I would have something that God would want? That I would have something that God would want. You see, I've got kids, and some of you have kids, and sometimes we'll go to a re restaurant, and I have a couple rules at restaurants. Right now my kids are young, so the rule is like this. If you order a kid's meal, it comes with pop. If you want an adult meal, you drink water. Right? It's just a rule in the Howell House, all right? And so there's always that consternation at the ordering time. When my boys and my daughter, who can eat just with the, with the best of us, all right, they look at that menu like, ooh, do I want a, like a, a full hamburger or just a little kitty-sized hamburger? Like, ooh, do I want cherry Coke today or do I want water? Sometimes uh, when we're going, they, they try to appreciate what we're doing. They say, hey, Dad, we can help too. And, and I remember one time my, my son had a quarter to help. Now, let's be honest. I probably lost more quarters than they brought to me in my life. A quarter in my life is not going to make much of a difference. A quarter will not help me pay my mortgage. A quarter will not help me uh, put much gas into the vehicle with an avalanche. A quarter won't get me far with my consumer's bill. It won't do much. It'll about get you a cheap plastic ring from one of those dispensers at a store. Yet I appreciate their heart. If we stop and think, the fact is what we bring God is even of less value than a quarter is to me. But that wasn't the point. But to think that, that God would, would have something or desire something from you and from I and to know that we could have a part in something that will last far beyond us. My wife, when she was teaching in Mount Morris, drew some, some cartoon characters. She was a very, very accomplished artist. Uh, so am I if all you want is stick figures. But she can actually draw things. And, and then they end up using those little drawings for uh, her building and then end up putting them on the sign out front. We have a pastor. She goes, look at those. those I drew those little, those, she goes, I drew those little those figures right there. And it's like, that's a cool thing. Have something that will last beyond you or, or beyond me. The fact is, not only with the tabernacle, but every time we come to give to God, we have an opportunity to give to God for long term. I want to talk this morning very briefly on this heart of giving. And first of all, I see this. There's a heart of willingness to give. It says in verse 21, their heart was stirred up. I say it's uplifting. Their heart was lifted up toward this goal. They, they saw something that could be done. Their affections were set on something bigger than themselves. Matthew 6, says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Colossians verse, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, let's be honest. Let's be transparent for a moment. Normally, our affections are set down here. Anybody have a wanter list? Things you look at? Things you're like, boy, I wouldn't mind that. Maybe you don't have a wanter list, but you get a wanter list every time you go to the store. I see that. Oh, I, I need that. How can I survive without that? How have I lived before I had this? Whatever it may be. The fact is we always struggle with our affections being set up there because they're often set down here. We can get after our kids and say, kids, you be grateful, but come on, adults. We need to be grateful and thankful and be content with such things as we have. There was an uplifting. They had their hearts stirred up toward a goal. This goal was a tabernacle. This goal was bigger than them. 
and this goal, this tabernacle, was not for them. It was for God, an affection set on things above. But there was an understanding. In verse 21, there's a, if you look there in the second phrase of verse 21, or the third phrase, I'm sorry, it says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, here it is, and they brought the Lord's offering. Now, let you look at that. It wasn't Moses' offering. It, it's not First Baptist's church offering. It is the Lord's offering. There's an understanding that it was bigger than themselves. I found this quote all too often. We regard stewardship and giving simply as a matter of our giving to God. But this is secondary. Before we give, we must possess. And before we possess, we must receive. Therefore, giving and stewardship is first of all receiving God's good and gracious gifts. And once received, these gifts are not to be used for our own good solely, but used for the benefit of others and ultimately for the glory of God. I thought that was an interesting perspective, that stewardship does not begin with giving. It first begins with possessing and receiving. What I've received, I now possess. What I possess, I now give back to God. You see, there's an understanding it was the Lord's offering. And then I see this passage, there was a unity. I thought it was interesting uh, that it says, uh, I believe it's in uh, um, verse 22, and they came both men and women. Sometimes the Bible will talk about men in a generic sense about people. Sometimes it talks about women in a specific sense or men in a specific sense. But here the Bible makes a point to teach us that this offering was for all the adults, everybody. There were men and women who came and gave. It was not just for the husbands as the, as the head of the household or, and the wives. It was for men and, and women, but it was not universal. Verse 21 tells us that everyone whose heart, whose spirit was made willing. That, that leads me to believe that there were some people who didn't give to this offering. There are some people who said, you know what? I don't want to give. I don't want to help this tabernacle. I don't really want to be a part of this, this operation. I don't want to do that. No, it was unified. It was not universal. Some people didn't get involved, and some people hoarded their own substance. The fact is, we'll take an offering after the service like we always do. There will be some people who will give, and some will say, no, I won't. Now, the I won't may be because someone doesn't believe they can or, or because they feel that, that, that they can't, but the result is the same. There's either you give or you don't. And you could say, well, Pastor Al, you don't know my bills, and you're right, I don't know your bills. Pastor Al, you don't know what I make, and you're exactly right, I don't know what you make, but God does. And this is out of a heart to give. I see a heart of willingness to give, but then I see a heart of willingness to serve. Verses 25 and 26. You see, part of stewardship and giving is not just of my treasure, but of what I, I have to do, my talents. You know, we're all gifted differently. The verse 25 says, And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And verse 26, and all the women whose hearts stirred them up uh, in wisdom spun goat's hair. There was, first of all, I see some dedication. I did some research, a little bit of research on what it would take back in this time frame to spin linen. All right, and see what kind of tools they would have had. I, I think of, of sewing now and I think of sewing machines. Now, it doesn't matter if I have a sewing machine or a manual needle and thread, I can't sew. But some of you ladies are quite accomplished at that. Some of you are quite talented at that, and you can make the, the fabric dance and do whatever you want it to do, and, and the thread. And I looked at what it would have taken to spin these things, and, and they would have had very primitive equipment. Help me here. Where were they when this took place? The desert. The desert. Last time I checked, there's not too many electrical lines in the desert. Not too many battery packs of Milwaukee-powered fuel cells to help them with the spinning. They're in the desert. I doubt that their spinning equipment would have been the biggest priority when they fled Egypt. All right? So they would have had, some, at the best, some hand tools to spin these things. 
There would have been some dedication. It would have taken, what I'm saying is, it would have taken some work to bring this offering. They would have taken some work for these ladies to sit there and spin this and work and to prepare this. And while now we can go to Michael's or Joanne's, you can buy bolts and bolts of fabric if you wanted to. All right, you could buy it all out and have just fabric upon fabric. Can you imagine the time it would have taken for someone to, to, to spin maybe a three-foot by six-foot piece of, of linen by hand, stitch after stitch after stitch? So when they brought this piece, this represented some time, represented some effort, represented some wisdom. You see, this offering, there was a heart of willingness to serve. There was dedication. But there was some diversity. I love the fact that this, this verse tells us that some spun blue, some spun scarlet, some spun purple, and some, who were really good, spun goat's hair. I mean, the really, really, really good ones got through the goat's hair. Which one is exalted in this passage? All of them. All of them. It wasn't like, like, oh, this lady just brought blue, but this one brought goat's hair. Oh, this one brought scarlet. They just brought blue over there. No. I see the diversity that they all brought something a little bit different, but they're all honored. You know that God will ask of us perhaps different things in our stewardship and giving? He may ask some people to be, to be more sacrificial. But the fact is, if they obey the Lord, they didn't get more honor. They got honor because they obeyed. It's not a competition. Well, look at me, Pastor. Look what I put in last week. Well, praise the Lord. Did you obey God? Because you could put in a whole lot more than somebody else and still not be commended because of your lack of obedience. In the New Testament, we see that with the lady with the widow's two mites, right? With the widow's mite. And Jesus saw her offering, her willingness and said it was bigger than all the other amounts. There was a diversity and a dedication. But lastly, I see this. I see a heart of willingness to invest. In verses 30 through 35, we're introduced to a, a, an interesting character by the name of Bezalel. Bezalel, uh, the Bible tells us, was uniquely gifted and uniquely blessed with his hands, ability to, to fashion things. I've met some people like that who just can just with wood or with other, other things, just fashion things with clay. It's amazing. And the Bible says that Bezalel had this gift. In fact, he's going to fashion a whole lot for the, for the tabernacle. But it's interesting in verse number 34 that that's not all he's asked to do. If you look in verse 34 of Exodus chapter 35, the Bible says, And he, that's God, have put in his heart that he may teach. I see that, that last of all, not only do we have a, a heart of willingness to give, a heart of willingness to serve, but a heart of willingness to invest. You see, Bezalel was uniquely gifted for this job, but he understood it was his job to invest, not to hoard. To give, to help others, to help this process go forwards. When we, when we hoard, we miss the blessing of God. I read this story. There was a man named James Crocker. He was, a, he was a successful entrepreneur, and one day he and a few of his friends went out on a boat trip to catch lobsters. They succeeded in gathering a massive catch of 125 lobsters. He said when he got home, he had a freezer full of lobsters, more than enough to last him an entire year. The day after James got home, his friend dropped by the house, and James offered him a lobster. His friend Jeff was delighted. This interaction prompted James to ask himself, who else do I know who might like to have a lobster? Let me pause there real quick. That's a great question to ask. My wife and I love lobster, and our bucket list is to go to Maine and eat a lobster off the boat. So if you have a freezer full of lobsters, ask yourself that question. Who else do I know needs a lobster? Anyway, James asked. He got so excited by the idea of giving friends lobsters that by the end of the week, he had given away 122 lobsters, leaving only three for himself. He had such a great time giving, he didn't even mind that his supply had dwindled from enough for a year to barely enough for a meal. 
few days later, James went into his garage and was assaulted, he says, by a terrible stench. He followed his nose to the freezer and opened it to find that his electricity had gone out and his remaining three lobsters had spoiled. Now pause there real quick before I finish the story. What would your response be at that point? I'll tell you what our natural response is. I gave all those lobsters away and I'm not going to get a single one. This is what happens when I try to be kind. Is that how our mind sometimes works? Man, oh man, just trying to be a blessing and I get kicked right in the gut. Is that how our mind kind of works? Lord, why'd you let this happen to me? I was trying to give to you, give to others, be a blessing. That's what I get for it. That's how our mind normally works in the flesh, but not James. As he cleaned up for himself, at first he felt sorry for himself. But then he remembered all the lobsters he'd given away. And he said, it gave me great joy. Because if I hadn't shared my bounty with others, then not just three, but all would have been wasted. You see, when we invest in God, we're investing so that not all is wasted. You say, well, pastor, that's great, but, but we don't have a tabernacle. We're not building a tabernacle for the Lord. We know that this church is just a building, yet the Bible says that we're investing in something not made with hands. In Ephesians, the Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You see, we're not building an earthly tabernacle now, but we're building lives. When we invest, we can invest in lives for the glory of God and for Jesus Christ. See, a heart that's willing to give, a heart that's willing to serve, and a heart that's willing to invest. In A.D. 34, the disease cirrhosis of the giver was discovered by the husband and wife team of Ananias and Sapphira. It is an acute condition that renders the patient's hands immobile when he is called upon to move in the direction of his wallet or purse and from thence to the offering plate. This strange malady, someone has said, is clinically unobservable in other surroundings such as a golf club, a supermarket, clothing store, shoe store, or restaurants. Some try to use a fake remedy pointing out that deductions can be claimed for giving. But they say the best therapy, and that which leads to a sure and lasting cure, is to have an individual's heart right with God. The affliction is actually a symptom of a more basic need of the soul, the prescribed medication in frequent doses. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. And Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, Exodus 35 is not so much about an offering, and it is about some hearts that are right before God. When their hearts were right with God, the offering followed. So if you're having trouble giving, don't check your wallet. Check your heart. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, I wonder if there's some heart that you need to touch this morning. Who maybe, Lord, has been fearful, afraid to give. Maybe someone who has hoarded some of their talents, Lord, not willing to invest in the future. Lord, I pray that through today and through this month that we look at our giving and what we give to you, that our hearts would be stirred up. Lord, you know that my heart is transparent in the fact that I'm not doing this for First Baptist Church, but doing it for the sake of Christians and for the Lord.